Okay, I make it 10.15. So welcome uh, everyone to the second day of this meeting on human, humanely ending the life of animals. Um, welcome back if you were here yesterday. Uh, welcome if you're just coming for today. Um, and welcome um, especially to those of you joining us uh, at strange times of the day and particularly to our American friends who possibly have other things to worry about this morning as well. Um, just a couple of practicalities before we start properly. Um, you'll be hearing recorded talks and then the speakers will be appearing live to answer their questions. You can post questions in the question box which should be on the little panel on the right hand side of your software. You'll also in there find the document folder with some useful uh, documents. Um, the meeting is being recorded uh, and you will be able to watch anything you miss uh, later on and we will also be uh, issuing certificates of attendance for those of you who need them. Um, you can also watch the videos from yesterday's session I should say. Um, there's two further sessions today and you need to register and use the link for those sessions as separate sessions so they're different uh, links to the one you use to come into this meeting. Uh, and finally, if you want to tweet about the meeting, there's the hashtag on the screen there, HELA2020, um, so please do. And finally, just a few thanks. Thanks, first of all, to our colleagues in Switzerland whose meeting, uh, whose idea this meeting was in the first place, uh, particularly to Ingrid Kurler, who's really driven uh, this whole idea forward, and to Casper Jürger. Thanks to Steve Wickens, who's running all the technical side of this meeting in the background for U4 and thanks especially to the organizing committee who put a huge amount of work into making this meeting happen and selecting the program and so on and that's Dan Weary, Robert Mayer, Claudia Zweifel, Tom Gent and Naya Bosolo. Um, and finally um, I'd like to introduce Tom who I think um, many of you might know who is going to be co-chairing today and also has prepared a little introduction to the meeting because we're aware that because so many of you have been able to join this meeting because it's moved online, there may be quite a few people who aren't quite as au fait with the background to the whole issue as, as those of you who might have joined us for this meeting when it was originally planned to be a face-to-face -face meeting in Switzerland. So I'd just like to introduce this very short introduction from Tom. Thank you. Welcome back to this combined symposium on humanely ending the lives of animals. Today is day two, which is going to focus on laboratory animals with particular reference to laboratory rodents, namely mice and rats. My name is Tom Gent. I'm a neuroscientist and veterinary anaesthetist, and I'm going to start off the day by giving you a bit of a background into the main problems behind CO2 killing of rodents. To get an idea for the scale of the problem, it's useful to have a look at the number of animals involved. Here in Switzerland, each year we use around about 600,000 animals total in experimentation, and this is a number that's been stable for the last 10 years. Of these, around about two thirds are mice and 10 to 15 percent are rats. If you look in the EU, we use around about nine and a half million animals in experimentation, and the proportion of mats, mice and rats making up these are about the same. There are no exact numbers for worldwide use, but you can imagine based on these numbers here, we're looking at the total number of animals in the tens to possibly even hundreds of millions per year. Almost all of these animals will be killed at the end of the experimentation. There isn't good data to say how many of those animals are killed using carbon dioxide, but we know from published polls asking experimenters and veterinarians how they kill the animals, we know that the majority, around about 60%, say that carbon dioxide is their first choice used for killing of animals. Possibly more important than the number of animals in experimentation, are animals that are surplus as a result of breeding programs. These are animals usually around about three to four weeks of age that are either of the wrong genotype or the wrong sex. And this number of animals is not typically included in animals in experimentation. We estimate that the total number of animals can be several times higher than the recorded number. 
There are advantages to using carbon dioxide to kill laboratory rodents. And if you attended yesterday's meeting, you would have heard a good summary by Hugh College. But just to recap some of these points, carbon dioxide is a very quick, simple, and most importantly, reliable way of killing animals. It's odorless and doesn't contaminate tissues. So animals being killed for the purpose of experimentation can usually have tissues and organs harvested in a viable state afterwards. Most people consider that it's not distressing for the operator to use. And in fact, with commercially available devices, such as the one shown on the screen, actually very little training is required to operate these. Of course, multiple animals can be processed at the same time within a home cage, which reduces stress. The AVMA guidelines for the humane killing of animals have been updated this year. There is a 2020 edition. The guidelines for use of carbon dioxide for killing rodents states that gradual fill only should be used. In other words, animals shouldn't be placed in a pre-fill chamber with carbon dioxide and that this flow rate should be between 30 to 70 percent of the chamber volume per minute. Carbon dioxide flow should be considered one minute after respiratory arrest to ensure that the animal is dead and recommended is that a secondary killing method such as decapitation or exsanguination is used. One possible issue that we have with the guidelines as they stand at the moment is that whilst they seem to be based on common sense practice, there is very little evidence to back up the appropriate use of carbon dioxide. When carbon dioxide is absorbed into the body, it dissociates in water to produce hydrogen ions. These hydrogen ions result in a drop in intracellular and extracellular pH, as seen in the figure on the left. And this drops to a level that is inconducive with life. The result of this is a reduction in the excitatory activity of both nervous and cardiac tissue, as can be seen with the reduction in these evoked sensory potentials on the right hand side of the screen. The result of reduction of excitatory behavior in the brain results in loss of consciousness and the loss of excitatory activity in cardiac tissue results in cardiac arrest and therefore death. When considering the welfare impact of either a process or a substance, one of the first questions to answer is whether or not it causes aversion. That is an unpleasant feeling that the animal would rather avoid. In rodents, we can do this quite simply and elegantly using place preference testing, which gives the animal the opportunity to choose between one of two situations. One particular variant of place preference testing that has been used to assess carbon dioxide aversion in rodents is the light dark box, such as the one shown on the screen. This exploits rodents natural tendencies to situate themselves in darkened environments where they feel safe. When you place an animal in a light dark box, it will naturally tend to spend most of its time in the dark area and only venture out into the brightly lit side very fleetingly, since it feels threatened there. During place preference testing, a substance is added to the dark side of the chamber where the animal would normally be. And the experimenter then assesses whether or not the animal moves into the light side of the chamber, which it would naturally consider to be aversive. Therefore, the animal has the opportunity to avoid one aversive scenario for another. Whilst this method of testing is very useful to assess overall aversion, and whilst it can tell us a lot about an animal's preference as to how and when it wants to leave an aversive environment, what it doesn't actually do is tell us what the animal experiences after the point at which it realizes it can no longer escape. This is of particular importance because in the case of controlled atmosphere stunning, the animal cannot escape and it is there for a terminal procedure. What this testing can also not demonstrate is what the cause of the aversion is. Carbon dioxide has been associated with anxiety, fear, pain and breathlessness and any one of these could be an important component in the aversion that results in the escape attempts. As we're going to see in several of the talks today there is a very real need to get better understanding and better measurements of these negative affective states in animals and a significant amount of effort is being put into working that out. 
There's a significant and unequivocal body of literature in humans demonstrating aversion, pain, and breathlessness in humans as a result of exposure to carbon dioxide. But what this doesn't necessarily tell us is the nuances of what this might mean for rodents. As it turns out, mice are in fact extremely insensitive to ambient carbon dioxide. And in fact, there are brain circuits in the olfactory system of mice that can detect carbon dioxide levels at just twice that of the normal atmosphere. This means that a single breath from another animal can be detected by the nose of a rodent, therefore making them very sensitive. Pain assessment in animals is notoriously difficult, even with the recent advent and high uptake of grimace scoring. In humans, exposure to concentrations of carbon dioxide as low as 35% causes mild irritation to the nasal and ocular mucosae. Concentrations above this can result in intense pain reactions, and some of these concentrations will be experienced by rodents during uh, controlled atmosphere stunning. From this, we extrapolate that carbon dioxide will also re result in a pain reaction in animals, although the severity of it is unclear. What is clear in anaesthetized animals is that carbon dioxide at low concentrations of even 10% can activate nociceptor pathways in the brain. These are the pathways that signal pain when the animal is conscious. Humans exposed to a variety of CO2 concentrations will subjectively report a variety of different negative affective states, including feeling fearful or feeling nervous. And the effects of many of these can be attenuated by using anxiolytic drugs such as benzodiazepines. In rodents, one of the most robust tests that we have is that of freezing behavior. This is thought to be a protective mechanism to stop the animal being predated. Carbon dioxide as low as 10% in the atmosphere will induce robust freezing behavior in rodents. And this is a mechanism that is dependent on the amygdala, a part of the brain that deals with emotional processing. Probably one of the hardest negative affective states to assess in animals with respect to controlled atmosphere stunning is breathlessness, or the sensation of not being able to breathe properly. Humans subjectively report this experience when, when exposed to carbon dioxide. However, in animals, so we are so far limited to subjective descriptions of breathing patterns and rates. We do know from some animal models that animals will alter their breathing patterns, most specifically their depth of breathing, as a first response to carbon dioxide. However, this is very difficult to measure in a moving animal. Therefore, there are still a lot of outstanding questions with regards to the onset, the duration, and the intensity of breathlessness in animals during controlled atmosphere stunning. Hopefully this brief summary has given you an idea of just some of the many unanswered questions that still exist for us to be able to refine and improve controlled atmosphere stunning of rodents. There is a very clear need to be able to accurately quantify emotional responses of rodents, and some of the talks we're going to hear today address exactly those points. Some of the other talks deal with assessing alternative agents and methods. And some of the talks also importantly address what it is that we require as a society to drive change towards better practices. So with all that said, I'd like to thank all of today's speakers in advance for the work they've put into pre-recording their talks, and I look forward to an exciting day of discussion. Thank you, Tom, for a really helpful introduction to the day. Um, moving on now to our uh, keynote lecture for the day, it's uh, a real pleasure to introduce uh, Larry Carboni, who is almost uniquely qualified to deliver this keynote, I think, because he's, um, or was until very recently, a laboratory animal veterinarian who was dealing with the kind of issues we'll be discussing today in practice. But he's also uh, a, a scholar of um, the ethics of the use of animals in research, he has a PhD in the history and philosophy of science. Um, so I'm delighted 
to introduce his keynote on connecting values and data for ethical euthanasia practices in the animal laboratory. Well, thank you, Hugh, or whoever will have introduced me uh, for this presentation. You will be listening to this at 2 a.m. my time, so I've pre-recorded it four days early in the mountains of California in Sequoia National Park, standing in front of the largest tree on the planet. I'm bringing together perspectives from my work as a veterinarian, as well as from my training in the history and philosophy of science. In today's sessions, we'll be hearing many studies and empirical data in the area of laboratory animal euthanasia from some of the world's experts in this area. We'll hear about behavioral and other scientific studies of animals during euthanasia, and we'll hear about studies of humans, human attitudes and beliefs about animal euthanasia. My job here is to try to set the stage by examining some of the ethical issues and questions that science can illuminate, but that science alone cannot answer. Why we care about lab animal euthanasia? It's only the last few seconds to minutes of the animal's lives after all, but almost all lab animals are euthanized, and that's millions of lab animals that are in use worldwide. So if we think, what about 30 seconds of suffering per animal times, let's guess, 200 million animals per year. That would come out to 1.7 million hours of animal suffering per year. So we want to get this right. I'm going to reduce all of the writing on animal ethics, especially laboratory animal ethics, to what I see as the one basic principle that we must be mindful of, and that is that harming animals requires strong justification. Any and all laws and philosophies that allow animal use in laboratories converge in this general unifying ethical commitment. Certainly, there are moral philosophies that say we have no right to use animals in laboratories, but those are not the philosophies under which we operate when we are using animals. So if we use animals, this is the principle we all adhere to. And I also want to remind us, and I'll keep reminding us, that laboratory animal use does sometimes cause harm to animals. We should never pretend that it does not. This is the framework that I use when I think about laboratory animal issues, including euthanasia of laboratory animals. Um, what values drive our actions? What facts and data inform our actions? And how do we put the two of these together and blend them into an ethical course of action? So values plus facts combine to inform our ethical practice. And by practice, I mean anything ranging from individual behaviors to the most rigid of laws. How do we combine what we believe our duties and responsibilities to animals are with the facts that we have about how our actions affect animals to decide what's the right thing for me to do? Now, the interesting ethical challenge for us is that often we need to make decisions when the facts are still blurry and incomplete. Harder to see sometimes is that we're making decisions when our values are not very clear or are incomplete. How do we decide on an ethical course of action in the face of this uncertainty? And how do we know whether we need more facts and data or whether we need a clearer values discussion, or whether we need to do both. I am increasingly convinced that our ethics committees and IACUCs operate in what I call an ethics of uncertainty, making ethical decisions in the face of incomplete knowledge. And we need to make some decisions what to do about that. Do we need to get more facts? Do we need to stop and clarify our values? Should we work with what we have but use a precautionary principle? And if we use a precautionary principle, does that mean we're erring on the side of animal welfare to take precaution that we do not harm animals? 
or are we erring on the side of allowing the research and academic freedom out of precaution that we not delay and uh, block important and valuable research? Often, I think, we pretend that we have more certainty than we really have because it really does make the conversations so much simpler. So throughout today's sessions, we'll be hearing from scientists who are using different ways to help us understand what we know or what we think we know about how animals feel. And all of these approaches can have validity and all of these can trick us. We'll certainly be thinking a lot about behavioral observation of animals, including grimaces, preference testing, studying aversions. We will hear a lot today about aversion and aversiveness, so let's just make sure we're in agreement what that is, and it's essentially what animals will avoid. It's easier to study what they will avoid than to be sure why they want to avoid it. Is it pain? Is it fear? Is it air hunger? Is it something they might actually learn to accept if we patiently train them? Can we distinguish between these states? Should we distinguish between them? Dr. Turner found papers that discuss anxiety, pain, behaviors. Well, those are different things. They may manifest differently. We may treat them differently. We may prioritize them differently. And as with most issues in applied ethics, I think it's better to think of something like aversive or non-aversive as a quantitative, comparative uh, criterion on a sliding scale rather than a yes-no uh, phenomenon. Continuing on, in addition to behavior, there are other ways of studying animal welfare that scientists will try to put together into a complete picture that can include various physiological me measures in the animal's body, molecular studies usually done after the animal is, is dead. Sometimes response to treatments can inform us. If we think something is painful and that behavior goes away when we give a known effective dose of a pain medicine, that can inform us on the nature of the, the animal welfare. And I also always like to remember that there's a lot we know about our favorite species, ourselves, and a principle that we assume that what hurts or stresses a person likely hurts or stresses other animals. So during the day, scientists will be putting all of these types of information together to help inform us about what animals feel in any given situation. Now, I said that we need to justify harms to animals in the euthanasia context, so let's define justify. And again, quantitative more than yes, no questions, I believe. So how important and how high quality is the scientific project? How might a euthanasia method compromise the science? If high quality science might justify a high severity or very painful or stressful euthanasia technique, can simple culling of unwanted animals also justify a high severity technique? And then how much do the other factors that influence our choice of euthanasia methods, such as human safety, human emotions, environmental concerns, economics, or simple ease in performing a procedure, justify choosing higher severity techniques. And so just as we need to define justify, we also need to define harm. And again, I like to ask things in a quantitative how much fashion rather than is this a harm, is this not a harm, yes or no. And so how much harm is it if we painlessly end the life of a young, healthy animal to cull them from our colony? How much of a harm is it if we cause severe pain or distress to an animal while we are performing our euthanasia process? How much of a harm is it if we delay euthanasia of a severely ill animal so that we can obtain more data? 
But these questions do call for different types of evaluation. So number two is the simplest and the focus of most of today, and that's a scientific question. How do we refine methods to cause the least amount of pain and distress? Questions about whether or not it's a harm to an animal to painlessly kill him or her, that's not something we can run an experiment to conduct. I want to come at carbon dioxide sideways by talking about an earlier controversy in rodent euthanasia, and that's the use of tabletop guillotines to kill mice and rats. You can tell I've been thinking about this for a while because this is my 1997 paper on the topic. I think there are lessons to be learned from this controversy that can be useful in discussing carbon dioxide. That's both in terms of how do we develop and evaluate facts and their interpretation, as well as what values do we bring? What do we prioritize when we make decisions based on those facts? I hope you can forgive my United States bias. That's the history I know best. In 1963, the AVMA started a series of panel reports on euthanasia methods, mostly focused on shelter animals at the start, but quickly added laboratory animals to their evaluations and quickly began to proliferate the amount of science that was cited in coming up with their recommendations. As with carbon dioxide, the treatment of rodent decapitation has evolved over the years. So in 1972, the AVMA said the guillotine produces euthanasia without much comment. In 1978, they said it produces in instant death. Again, not much comment and no mention that maybe it hurts the animals and causes pain. In 1986, they cited a 1975 study in which uh, brain waves persisted in six rats after decapitation. The interpretation at the time was that that may mean that consciousness continues for several seconds, possibly with pain, although the AVMA did also state in the same document that unconsciousness is rapid, a word we'll see and hear a lot today, without distress or pain to the animals. That's confusing, but their bottom line guidance was that for rodent decapitation, scientists should either use anesthesia or immediately freeze the head in liquid nitrogen. There was pushback from scientists who feel they need decapitation as a way of obtaining chemical-free tissues for study and that anesthetizing animals for decapitation defeats that goal. And so in 1993, the AVMA panel report reconsidered it and said, well, it may be painful, but it is also rapid. Again, that undefined word. And they changed their guidance. No more anesthesia, but the IACUC should, or the Ethics Committee, should review the justification. In 2000, uh, persistent brain waves do not equal pain, was the determination, according to recent reports, not very recent, but recent reports, and it is rapid. And so the recommendation at that point was IACUC review and good training are required and now in the current 2020 version that is the same. And I should disclose that I've been on one of the working groups that contributed to the 2013 AVMA guidelines. And so over the span of less than 20 years, decapitation went from neutral to painful enough to require anesthesia, to maybe painful, but only ethics review is required, to not painful. And so in 1986, the AVMA was looking at a set of data, persistent brain waves, that was not controversial. Some fact interpretations that those brain waves might indicate consciousness and pain, which was controversial a clear value that they were striving to minimize pain and distress, which produced an ethical practice that, on a precautionary basis, animals should be treated as though this is a painful procedure and steps taken to minimize that pain or to terminate it once the head has been severed from the body. 
For the next panel update in 1993, the AVMA considered another paper from Van der Wolf, who also found persistent brain waves, but said that they were affected by pretreatment with atropine and did not argue that there were not brain waves, but that his data indicated that the brain waves could not represent pain. The AVMA's interpretation remained, well, it may be painful, and it may be rapid, if 13.6 seconds equals rapid. Same value, strive to minimize pain and distress, but with the updated recommendation to drop the requirement for anesthesia. So why are we talking about decapitation at a euthanasia conference focused on carbon dioxide? Now, CO2 has a shifting history, just as decapitation has had. And so we've cycled from recommendations to only use a pre-filled chamber to using slow fill without uh, carefully specifying how slow or how fast a slow fill chamber is to trying to more precisely define the exact uh, parameters for what you count as a gradual fill method. Well, for one reason, this conference does cover alternatives to carbon dioxide. And for many people, including people who were once skeptical about decapitation, physical methods such as cervical dislocation and dis decapitation may actually be better for the animals and their welfare than carbon dioxide is. And also, I do believe there are lessons to be learned from the decapitation uh, story. And we'll, we'll go over this list of lessons now, the 1985 paper that found persistent brain waves in decapitated rats is still cited in the 2020 AVMA panel on euthanasia. And the reality is, though people have sometimes said, well, it was just a single study, there were only six animals, it was never replicated, nobody who has taken issue with that paper has ever said, we don't believe that the data are real. The picture here is not from McKesk and Clem's 1975 paper. They did not present their EEG tracings for this question. Uh, this is instead from Drs. Conger and Johnson and colleagues in, in Massey University. But essentially, it's the same thing that McKesk and Clem saw. So everybody seemed to agree the brain waves were real, but their interpretation was what differed. McKeska and Clem themselves wrote, it must be conscious pain. You've cut through and thereby stimulated every nerve entering the brain that must lead to a massive sensory bombardment of the brain. And even anesthetics would not be able to combat that. On the other hand, there were those who argued, well, theoretically, it cannot be possible conscious pain, because you've also cut through the entire blood supply to the brain, and the brain will quickly go unconscious after decapitation. This will be something to watch with carbon dioxide disagreements. Are the data in agreement, or is it the interpretations of the data where we find some disagreement? And I really urge folks to stay tuned for Dr. Turner's review of the quality of the available data, because that itself is something we should certainly be wanting to keep in mind. During the decapitation controversy, before the AVMA settled down and decided to consider decapitation non-painful, they used McKeska and Clem's brainwave data, not just to talk about decapitation of rats, but to talk about decapitation of other species, such as mice and small rabbits and rodents, and not just to talk about decapitation, but to also talk about cervical dislocation and other physical methods of killing animals. Now, is this valid? Are mice rat-like enough for this extrapolation? is cervical dislocation in which there are no vessels cut comparable to decapitation. So should we be using the same applied standards for mouse cervical dislocation that we use based on data for rat decapitation? 
and we have to ask the same questions as we look at carbon dioxide. How valid are extrapolations among species and strains and comparisons with other inhalants? We have to think about if we get more and more precise in defining just the exact percentage of carbon dioxide displacement that seems to work best for one particular species, strain, sex, age, and prior history of mouse, do we potentially cone in so much that we miss species differences and differences with other strains? And the ethical challenge is what do we do about the hamsters and the rabbits and the naked mole rats and the mice of other strains if all we have our data from Sprague Dolly rats or C57 black mice. And Dr. Hickman's presentation will shed some light on this, but again, we're really wading into some uncertain area and making decisions about other animals' welfare based on our decisions of do we have sound enough data in this area to extrapolate to others. I mentioned critical anthropomorphism earlier, and that's extrapolation from our best studied species, i.e. ourselves. And this is the way the principle is formulated in United States policies. Unless the contrary is established, investigators should consider that procedures that cause pain or distress in human beings may cause pain or distress in other animals. In other words, if it hurts you, err on the side of assuming that it hurts other animals as well. Now, we don't, in fact, have good solid data on humans' post-decapitation brains, though there are apocryphal, and maybe not so apocryphal, stories that circulate. But we do have human data on what it feels like to breathe various concentrations of carbon dioxide. Again, there are presentations coming that are going to talk about some of this. But we need to be careful how uh, valid our extrapolations from human volunteers' short-term exposures to sublethal carbon dioxide informative of the situation in a rodent carbon dioxide chamber. But it is an important question because to the extent that we decide to choose one flow rate over another, some of that is based on trying to avoid pain. And the only really good data I have seen on pain and carbon dioxide exposure does come from those human volunteers. When we look at data and their interpretation, we also want to be very careful about biases. And again, I very much urge you to stay tuned for Dr. Turner's talk, where she's looked very closely at this, she and her colleagues, in the context of carbon dioxide euthanasia. Um, in 1992, Holson wrote a review of the available information on decapitation, stating quite explicitly in honesty that he was writing in the hopes that it will encourage the panel to reconsider its earlier position and drop the uh, requirement for uh, anesthesia and the assumption that decapitation is painful. So should the AVMA panel continue relying on papers like this that are very clearly biased because for all his attempts to present an honest review, we know that he's starting from a certain political position that policy should reflect the outcomes that he is presenting. So those are some of the concerns I have as I go through the coming talks, listening to the data that are being presented. But I also want to talk about uh, some of the values questions that came up during the decapitation controversy and continue during carbon dioxide discussion. So a frequent topic of conversation in the decapitation controversy has been how long consciousness might persist. McKeska and Clem reported an average of 13.6 seconds, but up to 29 seconds in their longest um, animal. Um, a curious paper did calculations rather than new experiments to establish that consciousness could not exceed 2.7 seconds, but one of the important data sets that he used for this 
actually came from human volunteers, and particularly a study of how quickly Oxford undergraduates, four of them, might faint if they stand up too quickly. But what are our values here? How do we do a moral interpretation of this information on duration of brain waves? So Durr says 2.7 seconds is short enough to render decapitation humane. That's not a scientific determination. That's an ethical determination. Uh, Dr. Kartner in 2007 has written that essentially per the AVMA, decapitation produces rapid loss of consciousness. And so it can actually serve as a comparison for other methods. It's become a gold standard in his hands of what constitutes a humane method. Most of the discussions of McKeska and Clem's papers focused on the average or statistical rat who had 13 to 14 seconds of persistent brain waves, but not on the rat with the longest persistent brain waves, 29.5 seconds. Is that actually an ethical decision to prioritize the statistical average animal over this outlier? So how many seconds of potential mild or potential severe pain or distress would push a technique to ethically count as unacceptable or problematic? I want to suggest that we sometimes use ethical anthropomorphism, I just made that up today, extrapolating from our best studied species ourselves, but it's much more eloquently described by Peter Singer in Practical Ethics in 1979 as giving equal weight or equal consideration to equal interests, so the interest in avoiding severe pain. On the right, you see the graph, 2.7 seconds, Durr says is humane. 13.5 seconds seems to be what the AVMA considers acceptable. And before we make that moral judgment for other animals on how long a duration of very painful stimulus is, we should think about ourselves. And you can try this at home in our days of lockdown. Turn on the stove, set the timer, see how long 2.7 seconds of intense pain feels like to you or if 13.5 seconds seems acceptable. I think it's a valuable exercise, but I don't necessarily expect you to do it. Perhaps the biggest controversies around carbon dioxide euthanasia include making decisions about whether it's more important to minimize pain or anxiety or air hunger we know that CO2 has various effects on the body and on animal welfare, and much of that depends on how rapidly the concentration of CO2 in the chamber rises. So we can study some of that and establish the facts, but then there's a value judgment. And current AVMA guidance prioritizes pain over other forms of distress, even choosing that we might want to go for a slower technique that causes more distress than a faster technique that causes more pain. Another lesson from the decapitation controversy that might be useful in thinking about carbon dioxide, and that's consideration of outliers and worst case scenarios. So we talk about the statistical rat with 13 seconds on average of pain or potential pain. And often in science, the mean is the most important number for us to work with. But in animal welfare science, the animals who fare worst may be the ones we really need to focus on. So the possibility of 30 seconds of persistent consciousness is something to consider very carefully. Also, without getting graphic, the arrow shows various ways that I've read anecdotal reports of what happens to an animal in decapitation if you do it wrong and don't sever exactly where you should be severing um, the amount of pain that may persist in a conscious animal. So what are some comparable concerns with carbon dioxide? Well, how badly can we do it wrong? What if we fail to flush the chamber after each use? What if there are significant strain and species differences we don't know about? What if we do it too fast or too slow or the tank runs out and the animal is stuck 
at levels that induce anxiety without getting the animal to unconsciousness. We need to think about these situations as we evaluate techniques. We need to think about what could justify a possibly severe euthanasia method. And so there are scientific concerns about the effects of a method on tissues and data that scientists are collecting. And there are also human concerns about the people who are performing the, the euthanasia, including their own safety, um, that comes in part from their emotional distress from perceiving animal suffering. And Dr. Hickman will talk to us about some of that. But we need to ask, especially on ethics committees, well, how well established are the effects on data with using different uh, euthanasia uh, techniques? How well established are they? And how strong are these effects? Is it something that we can say, yes, there is some effect on animals, tissues, but if we power our studies and use correct control groups, maybe we can work around those effects. So those may not be deal breakers. Scientists rarely state a need to use carbon dioxide to get the best possible tissues for their studies. Rather, as the Swiss Confederation guidelines point out, we use carbon dioxide because we want to kill large groups of animals at one time in the most humane way possible. But before we go too far trying to find a substitute most humane way for killing large groups of animals, I want us to stop and think about why do we feel we need to kill large groups of animals? The need for rapid depopulation when the flood waters are rising is pretty rare. Instead, this perceived need to kill large groups of animals in a short period of time is as much an economic decision as anything else. One technician, 200 animals, get these animals euthanized by 10 a.m. And we need to push back on why we would have such a situation instead of staffing appropriately to use methods that may take more time per animal to accomplish. So the rest of today's talks are going to include some really excellent animal welfare science that should help these discussions, as we have to ask, how good are our current data, and what more do we need to learn? But I want everybody to try to keep in mind that we can only use these data in connection with clear values and priorities. Data alone will not tell us what we need to do, including the ethical decision of how do we proceed in the face of the incomplete data that will always be incomplete. And what do you think? Can we all get together in real time a year from now and take this same thorough approach to looking at what do we currently know and what do we need to know about laboratory animal pain management? It's a question that affects perhaps fewer of the animals in laboratories, but still plenty and plenty of animals on painful studies that may cause pain for minutes, days, weeks, or months. So what are you all doing in 2020? Let's get together. Thank you, Larry. That was a, a really wonderful um, introduction, setting the scene to what we should be thinking about as we review um, the rest of the, the talks for this meeting. And I see Larry's joined us, and I, I'm conscious we've inflicted a fairly significant duration of suffering on, on Larry himself by asking him to be up at this time in the morning whilst also stressing about US election results. So I can only apologize um, for <laughs> all of that. Um, and thank you so much for, for giving us the time and giving us that wonderful introduction. Um, if I might take the chair's privilege and, and ask the first question myself, I think you touched on this really, but um, you the, including euthanasia in the harm benefit analysis is often not done very explicitly. So in Europe, at least, we have a list of acceptable euthanasia methods for rodents. And as long as you tick the box and say, I will use one of those, that's the last time you need to consider your euthanasia technique. Do you think if we asked the ethical review body, our equivalent of the IACUC, to add the euthanasia technique as 
one of the things they have to think about in the harm benefit analysis that we would get a change in the way we euthanize animals? Um, possibly. Certainly in the context I know best, carbon dioxide is the default. And so the justification that's required where I've been working is if you choose not to use carbon dioxide, what's your justification for that? So for instance, if you're harvesting pancreatic islet cells for transplants into recipient mice, and you have concerns carbon dioxide is, because of the pH change is going to render those cells less viable, you can justify a physical technique to euthanize the animals. But I, I think as long as carbon dioxide is still put forth as the default method, I'm not sure what a scientist would actually say in terms of justifying CO2. So I think that that's my concern is that it's it's so much part of our background. This is the standard technique that entry level staff easily learn how to turn on a dial and kill the animals. Um, that's I think that's a challenge. The, the, I think the interesting thing that we pondered in Europe would be that if you do decide that the euthanasia technique is a procedure, you have to give it a severity classification. So in Europe, we do this thing where we say that something is mild, moderate, or um, severe in terms of its severity, and, and um, therefore you would actually have to put a label on how much suffering you think CO2 or your alternative method is causing. I think that would be quite interesting to, to see how that was classified. Yeah, because we certainly work with this this ideal in mind that we can just very painlessly help an animal slip from full consciousness to full death as if there's no severity entailed at all. And I think for the veterinarians in the group, we've probably done that with individual well-loved dogs where you actually can perform the procedure and think, well, when my time comes, I, I would love for everything to be this nice. I'm just not sure we have that with um, with mice and rats at this point, that, that we have something that we can do and say, oh, well, when my time comes, wouldn't it be nice to go in a CO2 chamber, have somebody inject me with, with barbiturates in my stomach or whatever. So so yeah, it's, it's a real challenge, but we, we do, I think, therefore, reset the zero and say, okay, death, that's 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 not a problem. For us, we have our CDE severity system in the United States and simply killing animals is, is C, it's the lowest severity um, because we, yeah. we just reset that zero. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think it is a particular problem with rats and mice that we, we lack a method that seems clearly humane to us. Um, perhaps the one that we might touch upon is very instantaneous physi physical methods, which we might hear something about later on. Um, there was a question that's just scrolled past me saying, I think asking how much you can rely on those kind of EEG methods you touched upon when you were talking about decapitation to tell you when or when the animal isn't conscious. I, I think um... In 1997, I closed my paper by saying, well, it'll be interesting to follow this controversy as it goes forward, because my prediction is it will be more about interpretation of data than actual new data. And so if people wanted to get serious about this again, um, I think we really would need most likely more more data, including the various pre-death manipulations, such as giving atropine. Uh, the method in Massey it, it is to use a certain level of anesthesia that you know will still let no susceptive pain messages get into the brain and, and actually amass more data, try to couple that with other techniques as well. That's hard. You can't do behavioral studies of a decapitated animal, for instance. Um, and so the easier thing in policy circles has been to just close it all back up and say, well, yeah, it, it's it's not painful. And if it is, it's it's not painful for long enough for us to be concerned. But if we especially start thinking, let's move more people away from carbon dioxide towards more physical methods, 
definitely um, getting more data would be useful. And you know, we'll be hearing from Dr. Turner about looking at the available data. The quality of the data we have right now on decapitation and cervical dislocation is is pretty low and and a lot of old information. So this 1975 data set, that's six animals from um what's that 45 years ago so so yes we would need more data if we thought we should move in this direction uh, I, I think there's a related question there actually which is are there comparison data between cervical dislocation and decapitation uh, there are some the Cartner paper I mentioned in 2007 looks at visual evoked potentials not uh, just mm -hmm. less defined brain waves and actually, I believe in his work found that with his study set of animals, uh, cervical dislocation, visual evoked potentials persisted longer with cervical dislocation than with decapitation, not a lot longer. And again, um, I think whenever we look at these studies, we also want to make sure we look at things like, well, what what is the worst case scenario? So the animal that goes the longest, my big concern with cervical dislocation, one concern has been how successfully we do it. I did one study where I intentionally, unsuccessfully dislocated mice, anesthetized mice, just to be able to see, well, what happens? Can we use radiographs to diagnose where the, the fractures. This came up with rabbits yesterday, and the answer is, well, it fractures all along the whole length of the spine. So if you don't successfully um, get the animal to unconsciousness, there's a whole lot of trauma that's been done. And usually cervical dislocation is done without anesthesia. If you do it with anesthesia, you've got the stressors of anesthetic induction, but um, there's a lot more to be learned. and and. So yes, at least in that one study, I believe the visual evoked potentials lasted a bit longer with cervical dislocation. Thank you. Um, we've got, actually, it's a comment here that I think it's worth noting from Norway, from Vera Rodas, saying that in Norway, they, they now actually challenge researchers when they say that they're gonna use CO2 as the planned method, even though it's an approved method in Norway. So mm -hmm. I guess this may be an advantage perhaps of somewhere that has a more centralized approval process whereas you know i think some panels in the uk would challenge it others wouldn't so it would be a yeah. sort of institution based yeah uh, and if you were doing a study to evaluate it you'd have to justify why you were doing it probably but if it's just this this background method and to challenge a scientist and say well why do you want to use carbon dioxide and they would turn to me at least in an american lab and say we thought that's what you told me you wanted me to use. Why do I justify what you told me to use? So again, if we kind of make this ethical decision that, oh yeah, yeah, this is this is nothing. This is the easiest thing. And so we start from there and and have to justify something else versus I, I like your 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 suggestion that we at least think about for every project why this method of euthanasia. And, and the point you made is it exactly, exactly true. When I did lab studies on CO2, we had to get a license to do that. And the, the severity banding is moderate for applying CO2 to, a, to an animal in an experiment. So, so we kind of know at least where, where our authorities think it would lie. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just reading my questions. Here. So one from Jessica Walsh. Uh, there are reports of vocalizations when using CO2 after consciousness is lost or persisting after consciousness is lost. Do you think that this relates to your distinction between pain and anxiety? Vocalizations after, after writing after the consciousness is lost or she's put in brackets loss of posture. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, and that too came up uh, during some of yesterday's. Uh, talks how good is loss of posture as an indicator of loss of consciousness so um, and it varies with the various techniques that we want to apply to animals because just knocking out your ability to write yourself doesn't mean you've knocked out the ability to experience severe 
air hunger or severe pain. And again, I think our data are just not strong enough to say that, but certainly it gives me concern. Um, I'm less concerned about things like convulsions. Uh, convulsions, I'm, I'm pretty confident are mostly something of the unconscious animal, but an animal who's lost writing reflexes, um, and the comparable situation where an animal has lost writing reflexes but has gone down evenly, and so you can't really quite tell, could this animal write herself or himself if I knock him over, but when he's just sitting there with all four feet symmetrical, you can't really even quite tell this animal has, has lost writing reflexes or not. That's a challenge. Yeah. And oh, yeah. a big challenge too is, with all our euthanasia studies, everything is happening fast. So with carbon dioxide, so much of this is, can I get to the animal to unconsciousness before there's much carbonic anhydrase formation on the mucosa that will be, be, um, be painful? And standardly, when people first started studying inhalants, you would acclimate an animal to 5% isofluorine for 20 minutes before you then do your reflex testing, or you, you equilibrate at 3% and then do the next round of sleep. With euthanasia, it's not necessarily relevant to say, well, what does 5% CO2 do if I equilibrate the animal at that for 10 minutes? Because that's not what happens in the euthanasia situation. You're studying this, this fast moving uh, set of events. Some really tough questions. I'm terribly sorry, but we're going to run out of time, I think. So, um, there are some really good questions that hopefully we might be able to pick up in the discussion later on. But thank you ever so much, Larry. That was an incredibly thought provoking introduction to the day. Well, thanks for having me. I'll go back to reading political news now. Thanks. Enjoy that. <laughs> so, um, moving on. Uh, we, we begin our submitted talks of the day, and um, I'm very pleased to introduce Nicole Liebold, who, who is going to pick up one of the issues that um, Larry raised, which is um, the effect of CO2 on emotional responses. So CO2 exposure as a translational cross-species model for panic. So, Nicole. Hello, everyone. My name is Nicole Leibold. I'm assistant professor at Maastricht University in the Netherlands. And I work on a somewhat different research field, namely panic attacks. But we believe that our work could be informative for the discussion on whether the use of CO2 is a humane way of sacrificing animals. So I'm very excited to present my work to you today. Imagine that out of a sudden your heart stops racing that your breathing becomes heavy and difficult, that you feel dizzy, shaky, and even nauseous. Probably we all would think that something serious is going on. We would be overwhelmed by fear. And this is what someone feels during a panic attack. One in five people in the general adult population experiences such an unexpected panic attack at least once in life. And one in 20 people suffers from recurrent attacks as it is seen in panic disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder. So I'm using the term panic, but what is panic? How do we define panic? The terms anxiety, fear, and panic are often interchangeably used, but do they really mean the same? So I live in Belgium and in the past two years, some wolves started to repopulate the area I live in. So basically on a weekly basis, I hear on the news that some sheep got killed. Still, you know, I like to go for a run in the woods. And now imagine that you come with me. So we run or we walk through the woods and then we see these footprints. How do you react? How does this make you feel? These footprints show me that there is a potential threat. So I feel aroused and more vigilant. I assess the risk to, uh, to decide what to do. So should I turn around and go into the other direction? Or maybe, maybe I should follow these footprints for a while to make sure that they do not go in a circle and that I encounter the wolf when I try to leave the situation. 
So imagine in the end, we decide to continue walking. You know, probably these were just some old footprints. And a while later, we look ahead of us and suddenly we see this. A wolf. Luckily, not too close. But it's a fact that there is a threat. We might freeze, which helps not to be detected. But we might also think about which direction we should choose to get out of this. Probably our heart would stop racing, our autonomic nervous system would be activated. So now imagine that we carefully walk backwards and then turn around to leave. And suddenly we see this. One of his friends. Freezing might not be optimal for survival anymore. Fight or flight might be the better option. But whatever we do, we better do it quickly. We do not have the time anymore to assess the risk and to think about what the best option is. What it comes down to is that our response to a threat depends on the distance, the perceived distance to that threat. If we now map the emotional response to this concept, then the emotional response to a potential threat is what we call anxiety, whereas fear is the emotional response to a real present threat. Extending this concept, a threat coming from the smallest distance possible, which is from within the body, is what we call panic. So panic attacks are a threat from within the body. And I mentioned in the beginning that panic attacks occur spontaneously. So this makes it challenging to study them in real life. However, we can reliably provoke them in the lab using a CO2 inhalation. So you are very familiar with CO2. A low concentration of CO2 is present in room air, but we use a higher concentration, namely 35%. It is very well validated that this concentration triggers the majority of symptoms that are felt during a panic attack in real life. A CO2 inhalation is a pretty simple technique. We ask someone to exhale as much as possible, to take a deep breath of CO2 and to hold it for four seconds. Before and after the inhalation, we ask the participants to fill in brief questionnaires about which sensations they had and to what extent. For many years, we thought that only panic disorder patients are sensitive to CO2 and experience panic attack-like symptoms. Because healthy individuals and patients of other disorders, such as specific phobia, generalized anxiety disorder, and depression, only show a mild response to that same inhalation. However, by now we know that we can also provoke these experimental panic attacks in, for example, healthy individuals when we use a higher dosage. So instead of one deep breath, healthy individuals need to take two deep breaths of 35% CO2. The response to CO2 increases dose dependently, with 35% being the most efficient one and triggering the panic symptoms. Panic disorder patients still react a bit stronger, but healthy individuals react enough to fulfill the traditional assessment criteria. These observations suggest that a basic mechanism is involved that is present in every individual. CO2 causes a decrease in pH, and as you know, this can have life-threatening consequences. So therefore, it is of course important to detect and to react quickly to such a change in pH. And as a neuroscientist, I want to know which mechanism makes the pH system oversensitive in some people and triggers a panic attack. So to better understand the molecular mechanisms underlying the sensitivity to CO2, I applied the well-established human model in rodents and exposed mice to CO2. In humans, I showed you that we use a face mask and we ask them what they feel. But obviously, we cannot do that in rodents. So instead of a face mask, we used a big box. We pre-filled the box either with 10% CO2 or air as control condition. We put the mouse in it, and then we looked at the behavioral response. This test is called the open field test. 
Animals have a natural drive to explore new areas. However, increased levels of anxiety lead to a preference to stay close to the walls and the corners and avoidance of the center zone. Therefore, we looked at different outcomes. So for example, the time they spent in the corner and wall zones, the time they spent in the center zone, which is an open area. So you do not have any walls in your back that could protect you when you get attacked. And we looked at the distance moved and freezing, which we consider as a correlate of fear. A difference to the human study is the percentage of CO2 that is used. Instead of 35%, we only use 10%. And this is because you need a longer period, for example, 10 minutes to assess behavior in rodents and 35% would be too high for such a long period. Here you see the tracking of two mice. And this is a few from the top of the box. On the left side, you see a mouse exposed to air. On the right side, a mouse exposed to CO2. And there is clearly a difference. The mouse exposed to air walked around a lot and explored the entire chamber, all to the open center zone. In contrast, the mouse exposed to CO2 on the right covered less distance, and when it walked, it explored the wall zones rather than the open center zone. So when we look at the mean values of all animals, we see the same pattern. CO2 significantly reduced the distance moved, which you see on the left, and the time spent in the center zone in the middle. So this was associated with a robust increase in freezing, as you can see on the right. Based on this test, we concluded that CO2 exposure induced strong fear-related behavior. In addition to the open field test, we also tested avoidance to CO2 in a test that we call the two-chamber test. In this test, we pre-fill one chamber with 10% CO2 and the other chamber with air. And animals have the option to leave one compartment and go to the other one. They can cross freely between the two sides. So we expected that CO2 is perceived as averse stimulus and that mice would leave this compartment and spend more time in the compartment filled with air. As control, we used a group of animals that were tested only under air exposure. So that means that both compartments were filled with air. And here again, a tracking of two mice. On the left side, you see a mouse exposed to air only. And on the right side, a mouse exposed to CO2 in one chamber. On the left, you see that when both compartments were filled with air, the mouse walked around a lot and explored both compartments. On the right side, you can see that the mouse avoided the chamber filled with CO2 and preferred to explore the chamber with air. So let's have a look at the group means. On the left, we see that CO2 exposure in one compartment significantly reduced the distance moved compared to when both compartments were filled with air. So you see that the black bar is lower than the white bar, and this difference is significant. And during testing, I noticed that many animals showed a strong freezing response. Therefore, we analyzed freezing and saw that animals froze significantly longer when they were exposed to CO2 in one of the compartments. So again, we concluded that, that this data shows that CO2 exposure induces fear-related behavior in line with the open field test. So far, we exposed humans, panic disorder patients, and healthy individuals, and mice to CO2. In humans, we looked at self-reported fear and symptoms, and in mice, at behavior. And in all groups, we saw a robust behavioral fear response. But how comparable is this? What else could we measure to increase comparability? And something that can be measured in both species and that may be suitable for better comparison is physiology. Therefore, we measured the cardiovascular and respiratory response to a 35% CO2 inhalation in healthy individuals and in panic disorder patients, and to a low percentage of CO2 in mice. 
As you might know, the number of heartbeats and breaths per minute varies between species. So to be able to compare the effects between humans and mice, we calculated effect sizes and compared these statistically. On the left side, you can see the effect size for heart rate of mice, the white bar, healthy individuals in gray, and panic disorder patients in black. CO2 decreased heart rate in all groups and had an effect into the same direction. This effect was particularly strong in mice, even stronger than in panic disorder patients. With regard to respiration rate, which is shown on the right, we can only compare between mice and healthy individuals because patients do not tolerate the face mask for anything longer than taking that one deep breath. And we see that respiration rate increased in both groups with, again, particularly strong effects in mice. Based on this, we concluded that mice show a physiological response similar to the one in humans. So altogether, we demonstrated that CO2 exposure causes a robust fear response and importantly, corresponding respiratory and cardiovascular effects across the two species. The primary aim of our study was to validate a rodent model for panic. Therefore, there are some methodological differences to the euthanasia procedure, such as that, for example, we pre-filled the box and used 9 to 10% CO2 for 10 to 20 minutes. However, from the results, it can be inferred that inhaling an increased concentration of CO2 causes a level of de-stress in animals that is labeled by humans as intense fear and even panic. We used 9 to 10% that is way lower than the 100% that is used for euthanizing animals. So what does it mean then to use a higher percentage? We observed in our lab that humans cannot inhale much higher concentrations than 35%. They get some kind of airway blockage that prevents inhaling the gas. Therefore, we believe that CO2 should not be used to euthanize animals. It is not a humane way of ending an animal's life. Thank you for your attention. So thank you, Nicole. Uh, if you can join us on the panel, that would be wonderful. Um, that's that's a, a really nice example of something I guess we might call reverse translation, where we take uh, preclinical studies on, on rodents and actually use those to inform about rodent welfare, even though the original intention was to, to um, study human health. Um, and much like the pain field, it's, it's really interesting to know how much we know about um, the responses of rodents because they're used in, in health research. Um, I'm just going to pick up on one point at the very end there where you mentioned about the use of 100% CO2 to kill rodents. Obviously, most jurisdictions now mandate a gradually rising concentration of CO2 as the euthanasia method. So we believe that the animals are probably unconscious by the time they reach about 50% CO2. I guess you would argue that that doesn't really affect your conclusion because as you said it's you're using 10 percent co2 to induce uh, panic yes indeed so that's a very interesting question and also point because of course when you look at panic research traditionally the exposure is a little different because we already pre-filled the box and we heard in the first talk that it seems that uh, when you look at the history, it changed sometimes, pre-filling yes or no. So the current stages is pre-filling again, which of course leads to a lower concentration. So to say that gradually builds up. But if you look at our data and you already see so robust effects, then I wonder what that means for ending an animal's life, because it's not that we needed 15 minutes until we started seeing the effects. Usually the behavioral effects are there within the first minutes already. Just they become, let's say, stronger over the time. So in that respect, I think our work could be informative and could be used additionally to look into that. Okay, so what does it mean when you use a higher concentration, for example? So I, I guess picking up on that as well, so we've seen the AVMA, the American Veterinary Medical Association's guidance on filling rates change. So they've asked for 
filling rates, I think, up to 70% now, so a more rapid rise. And I guess you might think, from your point of view, that that might actually be an advantage, because if we think that almost as soon as we get to um, you know, a few percent of CO2, the animals are starting to feel fear or, or panic, the least we can do is limit the duration of that, um, that sensation, I guess. You yes, I Indeed, I think it would be preferable to shorten the duration, but the question then again is, do you also increase their, their emotions, whatever they feel? Because I think we do also do not win if we shorten the duration, but then substantially increase the negative effect, right? So in that respect, I think uh, that, that's a delicate balance to find. That's a very challenging task. And also, you, if you go to a very high flow rate, you may be introducing pain into the whole um, set of emotions that the animal is experiencing as well. Just yes, yeah. Especially when you look at behavioral testing, um, it has also been observed that just the inflow can already be perceived as aversive to these animals. So we use the big box with inflow on the top so that they are definitely not somewhere in the flow. Uh, but also that noise can cause some kind of distress, of course. And that is also the question again, to what extent is that perceived as bothersome? So even increasing the flow rate might also not be the best way to go. So it's, I think we have challenges from all different perspectives. Uh, so the behavioral research field can give some insights here because you see like if you have a flow, for example, on a certain spot, that animals tend to avoid that. They do not like sitting under that direct airflow. Absolutely. So we have a question here from David Pritchard, who's asking, how does the effect of CO2 causing panic equate with uh, the belief that CO2 has anesthetic effects? Ah, that, that's a very good question. So I think, so I, I come from the, the panic human research field mainly. Um, and there, it's already used for more than 30 years. And, and interestingly, also the history of using CO2 as a panic induce, inducing agent was a little different in the beginning because it was thought to have uh, the opposite effects. So you talk about maybe anesthetic effects and they wanted to use it as a, let's say, anxiolytic treatment. But then they anecdotally observe that it has panic inducing effects. So I think CO2 can have some kind of anesthetic effects if you reach the right level. But that level might be very narrow. And once you shift out of that tiny window and you get to that panic response, then, then it doesn't work anymore. But I do not believe that there is a lot of research done that really looks into that delicate balance and to find that window what is the ideal uh, window we want to go for and i think in terms of actual general anesthesia we know that the concentration you need to induce on consciousness with co2 is sort of 40 maybe 50 percent which is much higher than the the panicogenic concentrations that you're talking about um, so um there's a question here that says um I think they're basically asking whether we know anything about the anxiety or fear induced by any of the other methods for euthanizing animals. And he's asking here about restraint for decapitation, for instance. So I guess trying to trying to titrate all the different methods and see which one is least um, anecdotic. Yeah, I think that would be interesting. That's also some kind of translational research, of course, going from the animal models back to humans and see what is available. Um, I'm afraid that most of the, the methods are not used to that extent in humans, of course. Um, first of all, because it's, it's not a point of research in humans. Uh, we have for human surgeries, we have other anesthetics that we want to use, and usually you do not want to euthanize these uh, people. So in that respect, I think there's a huge gap. Uh, definitely decapitation, et cetera, as we heard in the first uh, talks, not, not really investigated in humans, of course. So that, but that would be a very interesting point to, to look into maybe um, also accidental um, findings, sometimes case studies where something goes wrong during a surgery or so, where maybe some of these anesthetics are used. But this is definitely a research 
field that is not well connected currently to the CO2 euthanasia. So that I see the struggle with my field and how all these fields are actually related, but no one tries to really link them in that respect, right? So um, also with, with my planning, I tried to link it to the CO2 uh, euthanasia procedure also in my paper, and I received a lot of criticism about that because the methods are different, because I do not provide any alternative, which is absolutely true. But still, does it make it worthless? And I think it, it would be good to raise more awareness for that, that people also from different research field, fields try to consider any links and try to look into if anything could be informative on these questions. Thank you. Um, there's, a, there's some other really interesting questions that I'm going to have to hold over until the end of the day, um, but, but I definitely want to come back and ask some of those. So those of you who've asked the questions, uh, if you are here at the end, please pose them again so we can pick them up. So thank you for a really fascinating talk and bringing a, a completely different perspective to the issue. Thank you, Nicole. Thanks for having me. So now we move on to our second uh, submitted talk of the day. Um, we're going to um, discuss uh, the first of some potential alternatives um, to using carbon dioxide. Um, this is a talk from Ellen Dielen and Esther Langen from Utrecht University in the Netherlands looking at potentially using nitrogen as an alternative. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our presentation, Begin with the End in Mind. Today, we would like to discuss nitrogen as an alternative euthanasia method for rodents kept in laboratories. First, let's have a closer look to euthanasia of animals in general, because euthanasia of animals is not only relevant in a laboratory setting but it is relevant in all animal related settings. And we then see that not only scientific questions, but also societal and political questions pop up. And these questions relate to questions as, are we allowed to euthanize animals? And if we are allowed, then what argumentation is needed? If we euthanize animals, who is then able to do so? and what level of competence may we expect from this person. And as today's presentation will focus on methods, it's also relevant to consider what method is the most appropriate one to use. In that perspective, we think that welfare is a central topic. To begin with, the welfare of the animal who is involved. Linked to that, we also think that the welfare of the humans who are involved, who euthanize the animal, is relevant as well. An example of this is our colleague Jose, who works at our animal facility at the Utrecht University. Hello, for our research projects we are using rats. In the past we are using de decapitation as a euthanized method for killing the animal. I think it's, it's quick and I think it's the most humane way to killing the animals after an experiment. Uh, now these days it's not allowed anymore to do this in uh, awake animals. You first have to anesthetize them or killing them in a CO2 box with gradient filling of CO2 in their home cage. As an experienced analyst, uh, it's really difficult for me to see they're struggling in the last second of life. So it gives me questions. Is, is it possible to have an alternative or use decapitation again or have an alternative for CO2? So this was our colleague Jose, who works at our animal facility as a research analyst. And Jose came to me, I am Ellen Dieven, and I am a veterinarian who is currently working as a PhD on the euthanasia of animals and the position of veterinarians. And Jose questions me about why are we not allowed anymore to use decapitation? That was her first question. And if we need to use another method, isn't there then any other method which we can use but CO2 because I see that it has a negative impact on the animals. So when we were discussing this question, I thought it would be very relevant to include other people uh, because it was not really feasible to um, solve this problem by the two of us. So I contacted my colleague Esther Lange, 
And Esther is a behavioral biologist, and she is currently working as a researcher and teacher in lab animal behavior at our department. And now you might think, how did we end up here? So first of all, it of course began with the question of Jose, who came to us and discussed our question. And Esther and myself thought it would be very good to then share our ideas in a poster presentation during this conference. But due to the current situation, the organization informed us that poster presentations were not possible. And they invited us very kindly to give an oral presentation to share our current ideas and discuss them with you as an audience as experts on the subject. So where did our journey start? First, we had a closer look to the legislation, more specifically the EU Directive Annex 4. In this annex, focusing on methods of killing, there is a scheme where all methods are included that can be used. For rodents, there are some mechanical methods which can be used, including cervical dislocation, a blow to the head and decapitation. And to come back to Jose's question about why she is no longer allowed to use decapitation, the legislation has a requirement for using decapitation, and that is that there should be no other method available. And as there are other methods possible, in her work, she's not longer allowed to use decapitation. Besides the mechanical methods, there are also gas methods included, which is carbon dioxide, of course, and inert gases such as nitrogen. Other methods which are allowed is an overdose of anesthetics. So to answer Jose's question about an alternative for CO2, we considered it would be good to stick to the gas methods, and therefore, we had a closer look to nitrogen as an alternative. Which brings us to our research question whether euthanasia of rats and mice, in our case with nitrogen, can be an improvement uh, in comparison uh, to CO2 with regards to animal and operator welfare. Um, and to start uh, this project, we already consulted uh, some experts that we have uh, very close to us. So we contacted people over a local animal welfare body who are, of course, um, very well equipped to uh, overlook the welfare of our animals in our facilities uh, when it comes to research animals. Of course, we also contact the animal facility as they have to also provide us with the facilities that we need to uh, perform this experiment, but also um, yeah, to, in the end, perform the euthanasia. And within the animal facility, of course, we have our designated veterinarian who is also, of course, involved in uh, overlooking the welfare of the animals, but also checking the animals if there are any health uh, issues, which is also very important in this uh, context. In addition, we contacted our local veterinary pathologist, uh, because in addition to looking at measures such as behavior, it's, of course, very important to look at uh, the physiology um, and physical uh, parameters of our animals. And um, as a fourth one, uh, we contacted a company that might not be so well known to you called Anoxia. And Anoxia is a company um, that has already developed lots of equipment for the euthanasia of, for example, farm, farm animals such as uh, pigs and poultry. And here they use a very special method, so they use nitrogen as well, um, and uh, they use nitrogen foam to be more uh, exact. And the advantage of nitrogen foam is that, um, of course, the bubbles within the foam contain 100% contain nitrogen. And uh, with the foam, it's very easy to actually completely remove oxygen from the chamber in which the foam is inserted which means that um, animals have no way uh, to find any remaining oxygen anymore. And it makes the method of euthanasia uh, very quick and very effective. And it works very well for pigs and poultry, which, we, which is why we actually thought it might be an idea to test this on, uh, on rodents as well. But of course, uh, foam is not the only way uh, that we can go. There are definitely different methods as well. And Anoxia might be able to help us with the technicalities here. So that's why we contacted them. 
As you notice here, there are also some green boxes that are so empty. Well, they have some question marks in that. And um, this was actually already mentioned by Ellen. So we would really like to take this uh, opportunity to present here as a chance to uh, talk to the real experts in the field, uh, which are you guys, our audience, and um, perhaps uh, see if there is a way to uh, find people who might want to cooperate with us and fill these remaining spots that we still have. So in general, if you want to uh, develop or review uh, alternative euthanasia methods, there are some things to keep in mind. First of all, obviously animal welfare, as also legislation states, as we already know, that um, you always have to choose the method that is well available to you first, of course, um, but that is also, uh, yeah, has the least Im negative impact on animal welfare. So causing the least amount of distress to your research animals. The second point, also very important, is the type of research that you're doing, the questions that you're asking, and therefore the readout parameters that you're using, um, because they might be influenced by the type of euthanasia method that you perform as well. An example from our laboratory where Yuse is uh, also working is that we uh, do quite a lot of studies where we have to investigate the brains of our animals. And in that case, for example, uh, a method such as cervical dislocation is not very advisable because it damages the brainstem and therefore our readout parameter. So looking into the brain uh, can be affected. That's, of course, only one example. There are many more that you can think of, uh, but this is just to give you an idea. The third point that you really have to consider is uh, already, well, is user friendliness. And this actually, again, goes back to the, uh, the question of Jose, which really depicts very well um, the impact that certain uh, euthanasia methods can have on the operator that is performing the euthanasia. Um, and that's a really, really important thing to consider because it might also influence um, how you are actually performing uh, the euthanasia at this point. Of course, we already dove into the literature a little bit because, uh, of course, you have to start somewhere. Um, and as you already know, for CO2, there has been quite a lot of research already. Um, relating to animal welfare, we know that CO2 uh, can cause air hunger in animals that are exposed to it, to high levels of CO2. And also, um, it can cause acidification of, uh, for example, lung tissue um, and uh, mucosal tissues, so also the eyes, and that can be very painful. Both of these things can um, well, amongst other things, can lead to stress, anxiety, and fear. And studies have already shown that CO2 is very aversive uh, also to rodents. And um, yeah, that shows that Jose is not completely wrong in her idea that there is quite a lot of negative welfare impact in this method. Um, nitrogen, on the other hand, there have also been quite some studies already also in rodents, but it has not been as extensively reviewed as CO2. And what is known, um, or uh, the general idea is now that um, nitrogen is not completely free of a negative welfare impact. Uh, animals still show quite some signs of stress, anxiety, and fear. Um, and this might be due uh, to the fact that rats and mice might actually be able to detect hypoxia. So they not only detect high levels of CO2, which causes air hunger, but might also be able to detect low levels of O2 due to the fact that they, uh, yeah, in nature, they live in, in burrows where hypoxia might actually uh, happen a bit more often. So detecting that is actually very valuable to these animals. But of course, then detecting low levels of oxygen in uh, nitrogen euthanasia might then uh, results actually in the similar responses as high levels of CO2 have. So again, stress, anxiety, and fear. On the other hand, there, as far as I know, there is no evidence yet uh, that nitrogen can be painful to these animals. So that might be an advantage. And it has to be said also that um, 
well, there are maybe different ways to go about nitrogen euthanasia. And as I said, maybe uh, techniques that are used by, for example, anoxia might be uh, a good alternative to the techniques that we have av available at this moment. But that's still up for discussion and to be researched, of course. So um, in our study, what are the potential readout parameters? Of course, we thought a little bit about that, but feel free to add to the list that we have here. So of course, we would like to look at uh, the behavior of our animals undergoing euthanasia because that can tell us a lot about the welfare impact that the methods has. So um, for example, you can think about locomotor behavior, uh, but also seizuring, vocalizations, and excretory behavior. Um, of course, we also want to investigate the impact on the respiratory tract that can tell us a lot um, yeah, about the physical impact of our methods. So we might look for signs of hemorrhaging, edema or tissue changes, and that includes also, for example, signs of lung collapse, but also in general, just damage to the respiratory tract. Um, physiological measures that we would like to take are heart rate measurements, blood pressure measurements, um, and circulating corticosterone levels uh, that we might use as an indicator of distress. Um, and in addition to that, uh, it's very important to also take into account, uh, for example, EEG measurements um, to say something about um, loss of consciousness in the animals and how long it actually takes them to get there. Because that's actually, until they are unconscious, that's the period in which they can experience uh, distress. So that's actually the most important period. In addition to this, and I th we think this is uh, quite a novel uh, viewpoint to investigate also, is we would like to uh, look at the impact on the operator that is performing the euthanasia. And for that, we would um, like to develop uh, different questionnaires to send out to investigate the moral distress that uh, operators experience while performing the euthanasia and whether uh, our alternatives can have an influence on that. So the timeline, uh, as is shown here, well, we are not very far yet, obviously. So we are even uh, before step one. But what we would like to start with, uh, well, what we think is really important to start with uh, would be a systematic review on the use of nitrogen as a euthanasia method in rodents. Um, and um, maybe actually parallel to that, but could also be second step is, um, yeah, well, talk to Anoxia more um, to see what the uh, possibilities are for developing uh, yeah, new systems, new techniques um, yeah, to use nitrogen in rodents. Of course, after that, uh, we need to experiment and uh, yeah, get all the measures that I mentioned before. We need to send out the operator uh, questionnaire that I mentioned already. And of course, in the very end, uh, logically, there will be the evaluation and communication of our results. Um, but before we embark on this exciting journey, uh, again, I come back to, uh, well, posing the question to you whether you have some valuable input for us or whether you might want to uh, cooperate with us, uh, maybe form a consortium. If so, then feel free, of course, to contact us. That can go via email or uh, in the question rounds that we will have later on. And I would really like to thank you for listening until now. I would like to thank all the collaborators that are already mentioned uh, before. And special thanks, of course, go out to our colleague, Jose, um, who took um, so much effort to film her video with us. This is uh, really a big thing to do. So thank you very much. And we look forward uh, to see you for the question rounds. So thank you. Uh, that, that's a really uh, interesting talk and, and great to uh, hear plans for a study rather than uh, reporting the, the results. It's a really great opportunity for people, as you say, to, to become involved and make suggestions and, and to identify collaborations. And I know that there are people. In the audience, definitely have worked in areas that should be of interest to you. So I hope we can facilitate some collaborations. So please stick your questions in the question box or offers of collaboration if you've got some.
Um, I have a quick question about your choice of nitrogen in the first place and whether you considered argon as well as another um, inert gas agent. Um, yeah. Because I know there might potentially be some advantages to using argon in its gaseous form. It's um, more dense than air, so it's easier to contain and easier to work with, a bit like CO2. Yeah, we definitely did, but we came across it when we started uh, diving into the literature uh, a little bit, mostly. And the reason that we now went with uh, nitrogen is simply because we had some connection with uh, Anoxia and they have expertise uh, in that direction. But it's definitely worthwhile also to, uh, yeah, to take argon into account and uh, look into that a little bit further because of the reasons that you mentioned already. So. We're definitely open for that. So nitrogen was just a starting point, and uh, we definitely are open for expansion. Let's say. Okay. Uh, Thank yeah, you. I think I think it would be really interesting to see what you think. Um, there's a question here. Um, somebody says that I think the operator questionnaire is a very interesting addition to the research. Have you thought about combining? The questionnaire with cortisol measures during and after the experiment. So I think they're suggesting measuring the stress in the in the operators so that you, you get a physiological measure from them. And why, why don't we go the whole whole hog and put a heart rate monitor on them as well? I guess. And, and... Yeah, I think that's definitely very interesting. I mean, that uh, it should be something we uh, we we can take into account as well so it's a nice addition probably yeah yeah i think so as well i'm not sure if you can hear me yeah okay sorry yeah i think it's a, a very interesting suggestion to not only measure uh the cortisol levels of the animals but also of the operators to see what it really does to them um might be a good one to do it in addition to the questionnaires uh, once we have a feasible view on what the questionnaires say to us. Yeah, I think it's an interesting. Uh, I, I guess I have a follow-up. Yeah, I guess I have a follow-up question to that. What, what if we find a method that your experiments say is really humane um, and it's really good for the for the animals? But it's also really stressful for the people who use it. How are we going to um, decide? You know, how are we going to reduce that tension? Yeah. I think, in a way, we saw that in your day, uh, she was doubting if it was the best method for the animal, and that made a question the most. So I think if we are able to answer that it's the best way for the animal, then we can take away some stress from the operators. So I think it's also very important to educate each other and to discuss the subject and to give people some space to uh, mark their questions and in that perspective i hope that we could minimize the stress and operators yeah i think i agree very much with that um i think it's really important to educate operators to tell them what the Effects of the methods they're using are so that people can understand and and you know I, I think being comfortable that you're using the best method is, is by far the best way. Um, there's a comment here um, that from Han Kieserbrink saying that they're going to be doing a project looking at the influence of stunning on non-viable pigs on farm workers. So a comparable project, so maybe some collaboration there to see yeah. the emotional effects on farm workers are similar to um, people working in the lab. Very, very interesting. Um, and another comment here from Dan Weary about using the, um, looking at the views of the operators. Um, and he's saying the similar thing. Does it not depend on what they understand about the procedure? Do we need to better communicate the effects on the animal to the people who do the job? So I think, again, agreeing with what we're all saying that um, understanding that a method perhaps looks unpleasant but is the most humane for the animal is by far the best um, in terms of educating them. And I, I'm aware of um, you know one institution in the UK that uses cervical dislocation rather than CO2 because they um, they feel it's more humane and part of that is, is, is very much based around making sure that everyone's trained and understands why they're using that method, not not CO2. Uh, yeah. 
maybe the, also the other way around because the operators sorry i think the operators are also very informative to see what they experience and what they do think that the animals experience so i think it works both ways we can educate them about legislation and about methods but i think it's also very important to keep our minds and ears open to hear what they experience and include it in our research So there's some other really good questions coming in and suggestions for you. We'll make sure we catch all the suggestions and give them to you and we'll hopefully pick some up in the discussions. But we're going to move on to another one of your uh, good ideas now, which is systematically reviewing the data with the next tool. So thank you very much, Ellen and Esther. Thank you. So um, as I mentioned, I think <coughs> Systematic reviews could be a very important way to to look at the contentious issues in this field. And uh, Patricia Turner from Charles River Laboratories, who is also um, a laboratory animal veterinarian, um, has done that along with colleagues all around the world. And she's going to present the results of uh, a large systematic review into the evidence of the welfare impact of CO2 in mice and rats. Hello, my name is Pat Turner, and I'm going to be talking today about a systematic review of the welfare impact of carbon dioxide euthanasia on research mice and rats. I'd like to start out by thanking the meeting organizers for the opportunity to talk about this paper today. So what I'm going to talk about um, is the need to euthanize rodents in research settings because this is a little bit unique and different from some of the other um, areas in which we've been talking about humanely ending the life of animals. I'll talk very briefly about the effects of carbon dioxide inhalation and then um, a little bit on current thinking about the use of carbon dioxide versus other inhalant anesthetics for euthanasia and this will be based on a recent systematic review that um, has been conducted. And then I'll wrap up talking about some gaps in future work. So I think everybody is aware of why we need to get this right. Uh, whether you call it euthanasia or humane killing, depending on what part of the world you live in, it's really important that what we achieve is a good death for animals. And that's a death that occurs with a minimum of pain and distress. Optimally, it's a death that results from rapid irreversible loss of sensibility followed by cardiac and respiratory arrest, and then brain death. We certainly have a moral imperative to do this well. Um, humane killing is something that is very stressful for people. Um, it's an expectation, certainly, of people working with laboratory rodents, and it's part of our social contract with the public for being able to use animals in research. Euthanasia or humane killing is also a procedure that's referenced by all the major regional, national, regulatory or compliance authorities and accrediting agencies. And I've just listed a number of them here uh, for reference, but it's certainly not an exclusive list. So it's something that we have um, a lot of expectations around and it's important to get this right. When we think about humane killing of laboratory rodents, um, there are some specific needs that are, again, quite different from other situations in which animals might need to be euthanized. So when we think about um, what animals, it, it's the full range, the lifespan of animals from infant rodent pups to juveniles to adults to pregnant dams. Um, so we need to have methods that are available for a wide range of age groups. Um, we you may be doing humane killing for pain, sickness, injury, or deformity. There may be humane or experimental endpoints. It might be part of population management, so we might be calling animals, a single animals, large groups, small um, numbers. There may be emergencies, and as we've seen throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, there might be required depopulations or for things like biosecurity breaks. So we need to have methods that are available for humanely killing a range of animal numbers. When we think of where this might occur, um, again, we have to have procedures that would be safe in the vivarium procedure space, maybe in an animal holding room in an emergency, in an ecropsy lab, maybe in, in a, um, a chemical fume hood in a lab, or even on a lab bench. 
Um, so we want techniques that are safe for a range of environmental conditions and exposures. And again, with research rodents, it's quite a range of people who might be conducting the procedure from trained animal caregivers, animal technicians, veterinarians, nurses, researchers, students, and postdocs. So we want methods that are simple to teach to a range of audiences. And finally, um, we want um, techniques that are available to be used when animals need to be euthanized. So this could be once in a while, or it could be multiple times a day. And this brings up the issue of issues associated with cost, convenience, and accessibility. For large academic institutions, this could be up to 20,000 animals per year or more, depending on the situation. So um, it's something that it's, it's a very real consideration for us. As we've heard, um, you know, we have some um, conditions that we would like to see in place for um, humane death. And these include the things that I've listed here. We want to be able to capture or restrain animals um, with minimal distress. We want to have induction of rapid irreversible sensibility with minimal distress. The technique really needs to be aesthetically acceptable to the operator and observers because, again, this is um, one of the most stressful things that people can do um, when working with animals. We want something cost effective that's easily administered by non-clinical personnel with, uh, without extensive training. We want no or few safety risks for operators or observers no or minimal damage that may interfere with future use of tissues or cadavers and no residues creating hazards for carcass disposal. Um, and again, if we think about all the different areas where carbon dioxide might be used, it's really not surprising that carbon dioxide is the most commonly used um, anesthetic for euthanasia for rodents. So just recapping kind of the mechanism of action and what we see with, um, with carbon dioxide inhalation. Carbon dioxide was a short-term anesthetic that was discovered about 200 years ago. And its use for rodent euthanasia was described um, about a hundred years ago. And it has been used since this time for that purpose. Typically we see insensibility of animals at concentrations of carbon dioxide that are between 15 to 20%. And its mechanism of action as an anesthetic is acidosis of the cerebral spinal fluid. This acidosis eventually results in stupor and coma. The mechanism of action for euthanasia is apnea and cardiac arrest. It's not asphyxia. And this is when we have prolonged exposure of animals to 40 to 50% levels. There are carbon dioxide sensors in the brain um, and there's an acid sensing ion channel in the amygdala that's activated at approximately five to 10% in people. And people that are susceptible to panic attacks, this is activated at about 5%, otherwise it's around 10%. And we expect that this um, same sensing channel is present in, in laboratory rodents and other mammals. Dyspnea is reported by humans, dyspnea being a sense of breathlessness at concentrations of carbon dioxide that range from five to 15%. And we know that carbon dioxide is painful when it's inhaled at high concentrations, that is over around 45% or so, because of carbonic anhydrase in the nasal mucosa and on other mucosal surfaces that lead to formation of water and carbonic acid. On the right side of the slide is a typical carbon dioxide oxygen concentration time curve. Um, the rising solid curve is the carbon dioxide and the dotted line is the oxygen levels in here. And this is from a, a relatively recent paper that was published. Um, what, what was seen in this paper at A was increased respiration um, at around 10 seconds, um, loss of writing reflex at around 40 seconds, loss of corneal reflex um, here at about 50 seconds, and last breath up here at around 120 seconds. Um, and of course, the timing of what we see really depends upon the volume displacement rates as has been discussed. Um, and so there is potential for welfare concerns when using carbon dioxide with both distress, which comes from the sense of breathlessness and possible pain if the levels of carbon dioxide are too high when animals are still conscious. And both of these then are related to volume displacement rates. 
So I want to talk a little bit about um, the ICLAM task force that did a systematic review. Um, over the past several years, there's been increased discussion about the use of carbon dioxide for euthanasia of rodents, this potential for discomfort, pain, or distress prior to loss of sensibility, how long it may be took for animals to become insensible, and the best, best methods for use of carbon dioxide, so flow rates and suitability for rodent euthanasia. And what the International Association of Colleges of Laboratory Animal Medicine was seeing is that there was some confusion regarding the acceptability of carbon dioxide for rodent euthanasia. In some cases, researchers and veterinarians, it seemed, had even lost confidence in knowing what techniques to recommend or use for euthanasia of laboratory rodents. And this is really important because we want animals to be euthanized rapidly when um, endpoints have been um, identified. And there is also a need for practical and objective evaluation of different methods of euthanasia to develop guidance um, for what, what might be acceptable for various procedures. And so a task force was convened by IACLAM um, to look at this particular issue. So IACLAM consists of the four colleges of the American, European, Japanese, and Korean colleges of laboratory animal medicine. And I've listed the individuals, the laboratory animal veterinarians who were part of these groups. In addition, um, Meryl Ritzkis Hatinga um, from Radboud University um, uh, lent her efforts to this group. She's an expert in systematic reviews. And Jen Sargent, an epidemiologist and uh, systematic review consultant from um, University of Guelph, contributed their efforts to this paper. And just, just by way of um, discussion, you know, for people who may not be familiar with systematic reviews, this is a process that's been used for the last 20 years or so to help with evidence-based clinical decision-making. And we tend to think that information that can be achieved through meta-analyses and or systematic reviews is very strong in terms of the hierarchy of scientific evidence. So that's why this particular methods, uh, method was used. System, sometimes there's a large amount of literature available on a specific topic, and sometimes the results from different studies are conflicting. So systematic reviews help us to really identify and critically evaluate and integrate the findings of all the relevant high quality individual studies on a particular research question, in this case, the use of CO2 for euthanasia. Systematic reviews establish to what extent existing research has progressed towards clarifying a particular issue, and they can provide implications for practice and policy and describe directions for future work. Um, so there, is, um, there are very few databases available for systematic review. It's been used a lot more widely in human medicine um, and, and some special software is typically required as you're gathering um, data and evidence in papers. So our methods for this particular study, uh, we had a peer review protocol, the reference is at the bottom here on the left-hand side. And then we used um, a number of very common databases to collect our papers. We did first a, an initial scoping search to determine the extent of publications and focused on inhaled gas, but also used other agents of comparators um, in the studies were with carbon dioxide. And then we prioritized inclusion and exclusion criteria. Uh, we did restrict this to English only papers. And then we started our different screening, paper, uh, screening phases. So we have three different phases in a systematic review independent screening based on the title. This helps to remove obviously irrelevant papers. Then there are independent screening based on the title and abstract. And then finally a full text review and data extraction from this. And in here, we looked at any study that compared at least one welfare indicator as part of the study. Um, so the outcomes could be heart rate, blood pressure, EEG results, specific behaviors, loss of posture, loss of writing reflex, time to death, dyspnea, and other things. In terms of our actual data extraction, we evaluated papers from um, uh, over, over 1900 to 2017, and we identified almost 3,800 papers in here. Using our extraction process, which is identified on the right-hand side of the graph, um, out of all these papers, eventually 37 met the criteria for um, our systematic review. And studies were included if they contained original in vivo research data with an assessment, as I mentioned, of at least one animal welfare indicator in mice 
and or rats undergoing carbon dioxide induction alone or for euthanasia. Distiller SR software was used for our um, data collection and we developed a 232 question protocol that we tested and then used to define welfare outcomes for adult mice, rats and neonatal rodents. In the end, there were 15 papers that we reviewed for mice, 21 for rats and five for neonatal rodents. And the numbers aren't exactly, if you add these up, 37, because some papers discussed more than one species and or more than one age group. I'm going to skip to the end of this study. You know, there's a lot of data um, that's available. The paper is available also online. But what we found from this paper, or from this work, was that the study designs and the outcome measures in all of these studies were highly variable. And the other thing that's really important is that there was an unclear or high risk of bias in many of the published studies. Um, of the 18 outcomes, welfare outcomes that were evaluated, the changes were consistent or poorly differentiated between the different treatment groups. And it's likely that repeated exposures to carbon dioxide is aversive, um, but it's comparable to other inhalant anesthetics. And I think that's an important conclusion from this. Um, and I think also one of the things that was noted is that 30 minutes of exposure to isofluorine was not sufficient to guarantee irreversible death in neonatal mice. The risk of bias issue is really important because um, we, we did evaluate both study quality and risk of bias during the review. The study design and outcome measures were generally highly variable across the studies and there was a high general risk of bias in reporting and the study quality was often quite average. Um, for example, there was often missing information about sample size calculations and even randomized randomization of animals to groups. Um, and blind data collection and scoring of animals were really inconsistently employed. employed. And then multiple studies used non-naive animals that had been exposed to carbon dioxide or other substances repeatedly in pilot and definitive studies or even in other published studies. And I've highlighted a recent paper by Michael Festing talking about the importance of randomization. I put that reference in the bottom right of the slide here. And I think this issue of risk of bias is really important because all knowledge, including scientific knowledge, is socioculturally based, requires interpretation and analysis. And so when it's not blinded properly, um, there is a significant risk of introducing bias into our interpretation. And this has also been demonstrated um, repeatedly um, by published papers. And I've just included one by Deb Hickman here in which um, her lab was evaluating bias and rating of rodent distress during anesthesia induction for anesthesia compared with euthanasia. And in this study, um, individuals were told that they were, um, they were in different groups and told they were viewing induction for anesthesia versus induction for, for euthanasia. And they were asked to rate what they thought about this, um, the induction process, whether they thought it was um, good or not. Um, and what they found is that viewers rated it differently, depending on whether they thought it was anesthesia or euthanasia, even though they were the exact same videos. So just again, reinforcing why it's so important to have our studies properly blinded. So summarizing our carbon dioxide, um, our carbon dioxide recommendations and from the study, um, using what we saw was that in the papers that use gradual fill, this technique likely avoids causing pain. Carbon dioxide is a general anesthetic, so with slow fill, animals likely become anesthetized before concentrations reach painful levels. There may be some moderate breathlessness during induction that might be perceived as unpleasant, but many single trial euthanasia studies found no behavioral or physiologic signs of distress in mice or rats. So maybe it induces stress, but not distress. Exposure to volatile anesthetics, such as isofluorine and sevofluorine, causes stressful excitation on induction, and those substances appear to be irritating to mucous membranes too. Um, and studies show that aversion is stronger um, when animals are re-exposed to volatile anesthetics compared with carbon dioxide. So it's unclear if volatile anesthetics are significantly better. Definitely more research is needed on this topic. And I just included a paper here um, and, and one of the figures um, from that paper that talks about um, 
how we can prioritize studies to identify alternatives to carbon dioxide and perhaps some of these other agents as well. So just to summarize again, um, one of our concluding sentences I've just highlighted here, that based on the um, systematic review that we conducted, there is insufficient evidence to permit an unbiased assessment of the impact of carbon dioxide inhalation on welfare indicators in laboratory rodents. Carbon dioxide induction for euthanasia may result in short periods of stress or distress, but so does induction with other accepted inhal inhalant anesthetic agents. And the differences between the groups are small under even very highly controlled experimental conditions. So tens of seconds and the differences positive or negative between these agents and carbon dioxide, they're not always clear cut. So additional well-designed adequately powered studies are needed to accurately assess the impact of inhalant euthanasia methods in research rodents and more research in, is needed in general, particularly for neonatal rodents. Thank you so much for your attention today. So thank you very much, Pat, and thank you in particular for emphasizing how important it is that we have really high quality evidence in animal welfare, just like in other fields of science. And I think that's going to become a, a real theme in animal welfare science over the coming years. Uh, I'm going to steal my Chairman's privilege to ask two questions again at the start. First of all, you said that um, veterinarians and others who were advising people how to euthanize rodents were struggling to um, decide what to advise people. Um, I guess the conclusion from this study is that they should still be struggling and that, that you know there's no they can't clearly advise people yes or no as regards CO2. Um. I, I I guess I mean it can be we can look at it with glass um, half full you know as half full or half empty. Um, what this suggests is that. Um, I think I might have frozen, which is going to make. I, I'm sorry, but well, I didn't catch that, Hugh. But uh, um, what what it seems like to me is that we don't That's have the better method. Good. Yeah, we don't have a better method at this point. And when we say struggle, I guess I'm concerned with that term because as a veterinarian and animal welfare scientist, I, I really want to ensure that if a humane endpoint is identified that animals are euthanized, you know, um, rapidly. So we don't want animals being left um, because people are confused about is this, you know, an acceptable method for euthanasia or not? And that's that's one of my biggest concerns. And that was discussed a little bit yesterday um, in the context of farm animals. So we never want to see animals being left because people feel that um, a euthanasia method might be, um, you know, unacceptable in that sense. So. I, yeah, I would very much agree with that. Um, yeah. It's clearly the worst case scenario if suffering animals aren't euthanized. Um, another question. Um, do you think the conclusions of your review might have been different if you broadened it out enough to include studies that weren't specifically aimed at understanding the euthanasia process? So in other words, if you included some of the data that Nicole talked about earlier on that was actually from preclinical studies, but exposing rodents to conditions that they would experience during euthanasia. Do you think that would give you enough high quality evidence to to come to a conclusion? Um, I, I, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I because I haven't reviewed all of those papers as well. We didn't review them as part of this, so we haven't looked at what those methods involved, um, how many exposures animals had, and. That was part of the discussion in this paper of it is a consideration. Of course, we want to review all of the evidence available, but um, the results that we may see from um, studies in which animals are exposed repeatedly to multiple trials, you know, of uh, an inhalant gas or carbon dioxide, that's a very different experience for an animal that would, you know, be exposed in a single trial to carbon dioxide or another agent. So that's that's always the challenge for us when we're trying to interpret these things. We need all of that evidence um, to help us try to make the decisions around euthanasia. But um, yeah. it's really difficult to speculate here. 
and that's that's been part of the challenge all along, right? We're trying yeah, to bring in bits of evidence here and there, and um, we need to look at sort of the whole body and and um, and try to come up with you know our recommendations based on that. Yeah, I think there could well be space to try and include that data and then include your criteria um, to judge that data because there's clearly a lot of information out there, and it would be nice to to include it if we could. Um, I'm conscious that we've rolled up to uh, the time that we promised everyone for lunch, um, or not lunch if you're if you're not in Europe. I apologise to everyone like like Pat, who's got up incredibly early. I guess it's breakfast time for you, is it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, so we'll let everyone um, take their lunch break. Uh, Pat, I, I'm sure uh, there's lots more questions and discussion which we'd love to involve you in. It. At the end of the day, if you can join us later on. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you all. Um, so, we will see you all back for the second session at 1 30 uh, GMT, so in an hour uh, from now. And please remember that there's a separate link which you will have been sent for that session. So, I look forward to seeing you all in an hour. <laughs>